Well, take a moment in the pew in front of you and pull out this little card that says what we believe, all right? And some of you have been seeing that card's been there for a while, actually since last January, but if you flip it over today, on the back it's going to say what we practice. And I just want to talk you through that just briefly because we start a new series this morning and we're actually going to practice some of the things that we talk about here. But you may remember that back in January we talked about what we believe, seven truths that we at Fellowship Bible Church affirm, truths about God, Jesus Christ, man, salvation, scripture, church, and heaven. If you turn the card over, there's a second part to this series, not simply knowing what we believe, but knowing what we practice. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, things that Fellowship Bible Church practices. Now, for those of you who are new or visiting, just a quick point of clarification. Fellowship Bible Church isn't a part of a denomination. We don't have a headquarters someplace telling us what we should do or what we should practice. And so, for years, we have basically said, listen, Um, we just want to know what the Bible says and what the Bible says about these things. That's what we want to practice. In fact, sometimes I'll describe it to people this way. Imagine that this is your denomination or what your church believes. Sometimes denominations will then interpret the Bible out of their doctrinal foundation. And we've attempted to reverse that order because we don't have a denomination telling us what to do. We say the Bible is the foundation and what we believe and what we practice comes out of the Scriptures. It's interesting. The Bible often talks about um, what we believe and what we do side by side. In fact, in the Greek language, which your New Testament's written in, um, there's, there's largely two Greek forms that kind of comprise most of the verbs. They are the imperatives and um, I just lost the other one momentarily. Um, they are the indicatives. Indicative verb forms give you statements of fact. Imperative verb forms give you commands, things to do. You know an imperative, if you ever grew up in home and mom said, I need you to do this, right? And you said, I'll think about it, right? How did that go, right? In other words, a command is to be obeyed. The Bible is full of things we are to do. The Bible is also full of truths, factual statements that we are to believe. And so we would say we we want to know what we believe, and we also want to know what we practice. Now, we're going to take on the first two of those this morning. So if you're with us this morning and you're saying, wow, what is Fellowship Bible Church about? Um, This isn't all that it's about, but this is part of what we practice, uh, baptism and communion. And the statement on the card goes like this. We are called to remember Jesus through communion and identify with him in baptism. Notice the two words there, remember and identify. Let me talk with you about those for just a moment. Uh, Last week, we celebrated the Lord's table together here. We practiced communion here. This morning, we're going to let you see baptisms live. It's like a live... It's like a live show, all right? You're going to, these haven't been practiced. Uh, We haven't worked on them in advance. These folks are going into the waters of baptism down and back up again for the first time, all right? Um, In fact, just a quick caveat, um, they don't teach you how to baptize people in seminary, at least mine didn't. And so, like, my first baptism, I just remember that I, I, I put the man back into the baptismal tank, which is here behind us. This is when we didn't have a church building. We were using another church. I put him back, and there he was just floating, right? And he had this really peaceful smile on his face, but I thought, like, I can't bring this guy up if I'm supposed to immerse him. So I did the thing I was supposed to do, I, I guess. I just pushed him under, right? <laughs> And, you know, it went from a smile to, whoa, what's happening here? And what made matters worse was that I had him too close to the edge of the tank, okay? The tank's like a big fiberglass drum, so if you hit the side, it kind of reverberates. Boom, 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 out through the audience. And, and lo and behold, I smacked his head on the back of the tank. And I just remember bringing him up, and there were two people whose faces were like, ah his wife and my wife, okay? (laughs) All right, so this is the picture. We baptize by immersion, and you're going to get a chance to see that. So I want to talk you through just three things about communion and three things about baptism this morning, okay? So here we go. Notice that we find communion expressed clear back in Matthew chapter 26, and that passage where where Jesus breaks the bread and serves the cup to his disciples. Bear in mind, context, context. He is only hours away from being crucified, okay? 
And he takes a Passover meal, something that was meant for the people of God, the Israelites, to remember what God had done for them when he brought them out of Egypt. And he says, I have something else I want you to remember. And this is what we read. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I know I speak to many who come to Fellowship Bible Church, and your church background may have been different than what we practice here. So this is why we're talking through what we believe and what we practice. But perhaps you grew up in a church or a denomination where they told you that when you took the bread and the cup, they became the body of Christ. And I could understand how you could under, get that impression from this passage, right? Because Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body, drink of it, all of you. But what I would remind you is that we're probably better off remembering Luke's statement, this do in remembrance of me. Jesus often spoke in pictures. That doesn't mean that we interpret those pictures literally. We interpret them pictorially. Years ago, I was having a conversation uh, with a friend of mine who's an atheist, and he, he just asked this question. He said, Phil, are you one of those guys that believes the Bible literally, right? And I said, yeah, but sometimes the Bible speaks pictorially, that it's a metaphor, and sometimes when I can interpret it literally, I'm going to interpret it literally, and when it is very clearly a picture, I'm going to interpret it as a picture. Jesus here serving the communion to his disciples, when he says, hey, this is my body, we know it's got to be a picture and not literal, and here's why. Because his body is there with them. Are you with me? He's not losing parts of his body as they are taking the communion. In fact, let me just show you some other places where Jesus communicates with pictures. In John chapter 8, he says, I am the bread of life. In in John chapter 6, in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. In John 10, he says, I am the door. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the vine. Seven I am statements in the gospel of John. Some of them we understand literally. He is literally the way, the truth, the life, the only way to the Father. Some of them we understand pictures or metaphorically. He didn't become a vine. He's using that as a picture, right? He didn't become a door momentarily. He's using that as a picture to show us the way to God. In fact, even the shepherd is listed there. He says, I am the good shepherd. But Jesus wasn't a shepherd. He was a, finish it for me, carpenter, right? So he's even using that term metaphorically. Here's your picture. When we look at communion, Jesus is not speaking literally, he's speaking as a picture, metaphorically. And when Luke says, listen, this do in remembrance, Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, it's this great reminder that communion for us is a time to remember. So everybody's asking the question, so what are we supposed to remember? Okay, I knew you were going to ask that, so here's the answer, okay? Here we go. We remember that our punishment from God was deserved. Jesus speaks in that Matthew 26 passage about forgiveness for sins which means each of us, when we partake of those elements, pauses and remembers, listen, I was a sinner and I needed a savior. The reason I am taking these elements is to remember that I was lost, that I was broken, that I was a sinner. I'm always amazed when folks come to fellowship for the first time, they maybe sit in here and think everybody around them is perfect, okay? But guess what? I'm the pastor, and I'm going to tell you, nobody in here is perfect, all right? So the point is that you think everybody is, but they're not, right? All of us are broken. All of us were sinners. All of us deserved that punishment. In fact, to be real clear in it, Romans says it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death. There it is. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. This picture that we remember when we take those elements is, whoa, just stop for a second. I am a sinner. That's why when we take the elements of communion, we usually pause and say, take a moment, consider, is there something you need to repent of to the Lord? Is there something you need to ask forgiveness of? Because we are sinners. In fact, um, if you came here and you're thinking about making Fellowship Bible Church your church, and you're saying, well... I'm just going to be here a while and see what these Christians are like, okay? If you're waiting um, to realize that we're not perfect, that will not take you long, right? 
In fact, depending on how you pull out of the parking lot this morning, someone may let you know that they still have some sanctification work to do in their life, okay? Here's your picture, okay? None of us are perfect. Welcome to a place of imperfect people who know they're sinners and are trusting Christ. Here's the second idea. We remember that our relationship with God needed restoration. We remember that our relationship with God needed restoration. A passage in Matthew um, 26 uh, just captures it this way. Notice the end of it. Jesus said, drink of it all of you, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I love this phrase, forgiveness. It actually is a word that means the alleviating of a debt. Like you had a debt you couldn't pay, and God said, I'm going to alleviate that debt. But the word used here, forgiveness, is such a great word. It's, a, it's literally not only the alleviation of a debt, but it actually means that you've hurled something away, okay? Just picture this. You all, and me included, have things in our life that we wish we hadn't done. We've sinned against others and against God, okay? When you come to faith in Christ, it's like he takes that debt, and God just goes whew, as far as he can throw it. It's not like he says, okay, okay, I'll think about it, okay? He hurls the debt away from you. It's a beautiful picture of forgiveness. And it's a reminder that we remember that our relationship with God needed restoration, and God forgave us for our sins. It's also a great reminder. If you come here and say, well, I don't know that I've done so much wrong, that's going to be problematic because God's more than willing to forgive you when you acknowledge where you've sinned. Here's the third idea. We remember that the love of God is deeply sacrificial. When you take of those elements on communion Sundays, when you take of those elements, what's happening is you are being reminded that this was his body that was broken for you. This was his blood where he spilled it out in death for you. It's deeply sacrificial. In fact, 1 John 3.16 says, by this we know love, that Christ laid down his life for us. When... When we try to love other people, um, so often we're loving in terms of what we may be able to get back from them. I'm guilty of that as a husband. I, I, I might try a kind deed or something for Kim at home, but I'm always thinking, I wonder if she notices. Okay, Not so with God. God loved sacrificially. Romans 5 says, while we were still his enemy, still he loved us. Okay, While we were lost and broken, still he loved us. In fact, just let me show you that in Isaiah. 700 years before Christ was even born, this is what we read, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. When you and I come to the Lord's table, we remember these things. Punishment from God was deserved. Relationship with God needed restoration. And finally, God's love is deeply sacrificial. Now, one of the amazing things about the Lord's table is that it embraces all five of our senses. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. You and I have certain senses. We hear things. We smell things. We taste things. We feel things, okay? Those senses bring back memories, don't they? How many of you have heard a song on the radio and wham, you go right back to a place in time, okay, with you? Okay. Sometimes even just the smell of something will take you back. Like I remember when Kim and I lived in California, it was 80 degrees and sunny every day, and some of you were saying, wow, that sounds great. That sounds terrible, okay? When you grew up in the Midwest where you like seasons, man, it was like another 80 degree and sunny day, okay? And when we moved upstate New York, it was in the fall, and I can remember this, that we had gone to the DMV to get our driver's licenses, and I came out and there was a pile of leaves, right? Leaves, like just leaves that fell and they raked them up. And I went over there and I picked up a handful of them, and Kim says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm gonna smell them, okay? Right? And the moment I smelled them, I was right back like a 12-year-old jumping in a leaf pile, okay? I didn't. That would have really had Kim saying, what are you doing, right? But for just a moment, I thought, I could remember all of that, right? Whenever I eat a cider donut, I immediately go back to the Grey Bull County Fair. I don't know why. I taste something. I remember, see? Our senses were made to, re- to cause us to bring back those memories. They bring back those memories. In fact, just watch this. The Lord's table does that, doesn't it? We take the bread, we see it, 
pierced for our transgressions. We see the bruising on the bread. We taste it. We, it, you can even smell it, right? In fact, just listen, you can hear it, right? All of those elements, when we taste, smell, when we see, are meant to remind us why. Because we are incredibly forgetful about three things that our punishment from God was deserved, but that Jesus took it for us, and God through Jesus forgave us, and that there is nothing like the love of God. You say, well, Phil, I, when I became a Christian and I, of course I'm gonna remember that stuff. I don't think so, okay? The moment you say, well, someone treated me poorly and you get upset, hold on for a second, okay? Everything that it takes place in this world because of some of the things we have done, that our punishment should be deserved, but we immediately defend ourselves. When we began to think in terms of God owing us something, like, God, why is my life so hard? We are forgetting that our relationship with God needed restoration, something we could not do. And here it is. When you say, why would God do this to me if he loves me? Okay. You are forgetting that God's love for you is so deeply sacrificial that he gave his only son. This is communion. All five senses meant for us to remember what God did for us. Here's the second part. I'm going to teach about it briefly, and then we're going to go into those waters of baptism and let folks tell you their stories. When we come to baptism, we identify with Christ in baptism. Now, just a couple thoughts for you. Um, many of you here may have been baptized as a child. That's different than what we see in the New Testament, okay? I'll just say that. The New Testament baptisms appear to be adults or folks who can claim and express that Christ died on their behalf and they place their faith in him. We call that believer's baptism. That's why we practice it here that way. Uh, and again, um, that's not a criticism so much. It's just how we do it here, trying to do what the Scriptures ask us to do. So here's three ways that we identify with Christ. We identify with Christ publicly. We identify with Christ publicly. There's a crowd here, and there's folks momentarily that are gonna be baptized in front of you. Okay. I love that. You know what they're saying? They're saying, Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. They stand up here publicly, and they say that. Now granted, you're pretty supportive, right? That's why you're here, and we're glad you're here. But I just want to tell you, it still is a public expression of their faith in Christ in front of all of you. It takes, it takes courage and faith to come forward and say, this is what I believe. And now that I told them that story about whacking the guy's head on the back of the tank, it's going to take faith for them to actually go in there with me, okay? Here's what I want you to see, okay? That we identify with Christ publicly. We don't do private baptisms here. We do them publicly, okay? In fact, when I was teaching over in Ukraine, I remember my friend over there telling me the story that when they do baptisms in the Ukraine, um, in Ukraine, what they do is they take the people they, who want to be baptized, they go down to the river, they dress them in white, and they walk through town, right? Like, just imagine, like it's a bit of a parade. They walk through town, and you can see the people that are dressed in white, you know they're going to be baptized. Why? Because they are publicly saying, I'm a Christian. It's not a private matter to them. It's a public matter. It's them saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Here's the second idea. We identify with Christ pictorially, pictorially. In the baptism, you're going to see we proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In fact, um, <clears throat> the ESV Study Bible talks about baptism in this way. Baptism is an outward physical symbol of the inward spiritual conversion of Christians. In fact, um, in the early church, baptism was probably by immersion, that is, by dunking. Therefore, baptism pictures a person being buried with Christ, submerged under the water, and being raised to new life with Christ um, when they emerge from the water. In fact, Romans 6 seems to communicate that. Now, now granted, Romans 6, the use of baptism here isn't talking about water baptism. It's talking about how we are immersed into Christ spiritually when we're saved. But Paul uses the picture of baptism, a picture that talks about the death, burial, and resurrection, and the resurrection out of the water. Look at it. Do not, you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? See, we go down. 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There is, we are connected to Christ, crucified with him. We come up out of the water remembering that, yes, we are new creations in Christ. Pastors um, always get a front row seat, okay? They get a front row seat to what happens. Like when I do weddings here, um, I get a front row seat. Like I'm right here, and the the bride's getting ready to come down, the groom's standing by me here, and everybody's looking at the bride. You know who I look at? I look at the groom, right? Because he's right here, and I just want to make sure he can see her, and then I'm just going to watch him smile, okay? Um, And hopefully not run out of the building. Okay, so he's going to smile, okay? And then I look back at the bride, and then I look at the groom, and they get closer and closer together. And when they finally get here, and the father gives the bride to the groom, and they turn, nobody sees them but me, right? It's like the front row seat. I'm just like right here, okay? And here's this incredible picture that I get a chance to see their joy. I get a chance to see their fear. I get a chance to see that whole ball of wax, right? Let me tell you something. Baptisms are like that. When I baptize a person and they go under, When they come up, I can almost, I can see it, but I can almost feel the energy and the joy like, wow. Because that image of them being buried with Christ and then God covering their sins on the cross and coming up out of the grave, it's like, wow. They don't become a new creation in Christ when they're baptized, but that visible expression of it is so real, right? It's like, my sins were forgiven. And I understand it pictorially when I come up out of the water. Here's one final one. We identify with Christ personally. We identify with Christ personally. Publicly, we're not ashamed. Uh, Pictorially, we proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection through the act of baptism. But here's the last one. We identify with Christ personally. And I love this. We're just saying, I will follow Christ. I will follow Christ. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. This is a great lesson for us. If today you came saying, well, I think I'm going to spend my life on the way I want to spend my life. These are Jesus' words to you. You can do that, okay? But you're going to lose it. The very things you thought were important, you're going to grow old, and one day you're going to say, those really weren't that important. What did I do with my life? For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give up in return for his soul? Jesus said, follow me. In America, um, this act of baptism in a public profession and personally demonstrating that we're following Jesus, okay, Uh, It it doesn't have quite the gravitas that it has in other parts of the world or at other times in our world, okay? My grandmother, when she was baptized outside of Fort Wayne, Indiana, in uh, the St. Joseph River, was baptized in the winter, okay? And she said, I said, what did you remember about your baptism? Once I asked her, and she said, I remember that one of the elders took his cane and he pushed the ice off so we could get in. And you thought like polar plunges were like a new experience, okay? They were happening like in 1920, okay? This was the level of commitment that was taking place. But by the way, if you step out of our country, just step out of our country, and you'll see that that same kind of commitment is taking place. I remember a friend of mine once showing me a video where he had participated. He was an American, but he had participated in the baptism in Afghanistan of a young Muslim man who knew upon him going under and saying, I am personally following Christ, when he came up out of the water, he knew this, that his family would disown him, that he would probably be beaten, and he actually may be executed for following Jesus. Here's what I want you to see. You and I, in baptism, are identifying with Christ publicly. We are identifying with Christ pictorially. We're showing we were buried with Christ, and now we're risen to new life and we are following Christ personally. That is why, this is one of my favorite services of the year, that is why you're gonna hear individuals tell you their story. You'll hear their story, you're gonna hear what they went through, how they came to faith in Christ, and I will almost promise you, some of their stories are gonna resonate with you. You're gonna say, wait a minute, I thought I was the only one who struggled with that. I thought I was the only one who went through that. 
But here is the beauty. When we come to faith in Christ, we are buried with him, our sins are buried, and up we come, new creations in Christ. The act of baptism will not save them. These are individuals who trusted Christ prior to their baptism. And at the end of the service, just a few minutes after we hear their wonderful testimonies, at the end of the service, Pastor Scott will come and he'll talk with you for just a few minutes about how you too could place your faith in Christ.